We all know the story. Count Dracula, that infamous Transylvanian bloodsucker conjured from the mind of Bram Stoker, was based on the historical Wallachian warlord Vlad the Impaler. I bet you've seen a documentary linking the two, and in said documentary, I'm sure you were presented with images of bodies impaled on tall poles. Hollywood has reinforced the Vlad-Dracula connection, see Dracula Untold, to the point that Stoker's vampiric invention being a facsimile of the Eastern European fascist has become common knowledge. It's moved beyond the realm of Halloween party knowledge drop, well actually Dracula was based on a real life person, Vlad the Impaler, and into the popular zeitgeist. Here's the thing though. It's probably bullshit. The theory was first popularized by historians Radu Florescu and Raymond T. McNally, authors of the 1972 book In Search of Dracula, The History of Dracula and Vampires, and on the surface, it makes a lot of sense. Vlad III, Prince of Wallachia, better known as Vlad the Impaler, was the son of Vlad II, aka Vlad Dracul. The elder Vlad earned that menacing last name after getting inducted into a knightly order, the Order of the Dragon. FYI, Drac is the old Romanian word for dragon, although in modern Romanian, the language Stoker would have been acquainted with, Drac means devil. And yes, that is going to be important to remember for later. Anyway, given the patriarchal parentage, Vlad III thus became known as Dracule, meaning son of Dracul. Couple the name with the Eastern European location, sprinkle in a couple of stories about Vlad III being a bloodlusting maniac, and voila. Obviously, this is the man Bram Stoker took inspiration from when creating his Transylvanian vampire, right? not so fast. To quote Elizabeth Miller, Dracula expert and professor at the Memorial University of Newfoundland, first of all, Stoker did not get any information about vampires firsthand in Transylvania. He never went there. In fact, it was not even his original intention to have his vampire come from Transylvania. Secondly, he did not base his vampire story on legends connected with the historical Dracula, Vlad the Impaler. Not only did Stoker know little about Vlad, there was, in spite of numerous outrageous claims to the contrary, never any association of Vlad with vampires, either during his own lifetime or in the intervening years between his death and the writing of Dracula." End quote. And that comes from the book Vampires, Myths and Metaphors of Enduring Evil. But what about the name I can hear some of you shouting? Obviously, Stoker read that name Dracula somewhere. He didn't just make it up. That must be proof enough that his vampire was based, at least in part, on the historical Dracula, Vlad the Impaler. According to Stoker himself, however, that simply isn't true. Among the extensive notes he took while planning his gothic masterpiece, we find the following tidbit. Quote, Dracula in Wallachian language means devil. Wallachians were accustomed to give it as a surname to any person who rendered himself conspicuous either by courage, cruel actions, or cunning." End quote. These are not the words of a man with a deep understanding of Vlad the Impaler's history. Instead, these are the words of a man with a cursory understanding of Wallachian culture, someone who read a name and thought, damn. That sounds cool. But if Dracula wasn't inspired by Vlad, who, if anyone, was he inspired by? Our talk the bloodthirsty Irish tyrant who was killed with a wooden sword and buried upside down. While Bram Stoker was a master of the English language, he was in fact Irish. Born in Clontarf, a seaside suburb of Dublin, Stoker often visited the family home of Oscar Wilde. And it was there, according to retired Ulster University lecturer and author of Vampires, A Field Guide to the Creatures That Stalk the Night, Bob Curran, that Stoker likely learned about the legend of Auratuck. To quote Curran, Lady Wilde, Oscar Wilde's mother, certainly knew about the legend, and Stoker was a regular visitor to the Wilde's house in Dublin. End quote. The legend, which was well known in Irish literary circles, sees a group of villagers in County Derry rebel against a despotic Celtic chieftain named Auratok. With the help of a neighboring chieftain, Cahane, they attempt to kill Auratok on multiple occasions. The operative word being attempt. Each time the villagers believe Auratok to be dead and buried, he rises from the grave and demands bowls of blood in recompense. In a final act of desperation, Cahane consults a local druid, or in later versions, a Christian hermit, who provides the villagers with the proper remedy for dealing with a member of the Neve Merv, the undead or walking dead. The villagers run the tyrant through with a sword made of yew wood, bury him upside down, surround his grave with thorns, then, for good measure, they top the grave with a large rock. This has the desired effect, and our talk rises no longer. 
At least that's how one version of the story goes. This being folklore, of course, there are many variations of the Auertok tale. One of the earliest printed accounts comes from Patrick Weston Joyce's 1879 work, The Origin and History of Irish Names of Places. Just a quick note before you hear the excerpt from Joyce's book, there are a bunch of resources that quote this same passage, but weirdly there are slight differences in the wording depending on said resource. Rest assured what I've included here is what's found verbatim in Joyce's original work. And I quote, It is very curious that in some parts of the country the people still retain a dim traditional memory of this mode of sepulture and of the superstition connected with it. There is a place in the parish of Errigal in Londonderry called Slataverty, but it ought to have been called Lotaverty, the lot or sepulchral monument of a man named Auertok, who was, it seems, a dwarf. The dwarf was a magician and a dreadful tyrant, and after having perpetrated great cruelties on the people, he was at last vanquished and slain by a neighboring chieftain some say by Finn McCool. He was buried in a standing posture, but the very next day he appeared in his old haunts, more cruel and vigorous than ever. And the chief slew him a second time and buried him as before, but again he escaped from the grave and spread terror through the whole country. The chief then consulted a druid, and according to his directions, he slew the dwarf a third time and buried him in the same place with his head downwards, which subdued his magical power so that he never again appeared on the earth. The lot raised over the dwarf is still there, and you may hear the legend with much detail from the natives of the place, one of whom told it to me." End quote. And in case you were wondering, yes, you can still visit the lot that was, according to legend, raised over Artok's head, or feet rather. It's formally known as the Slotaverdy Dolmen, but funnily enough, given Artok's apparent stature, locals refer to it as the Giant's Grave. In the Irish film Boys from County Hell, which I featured in my list of the top 10 Irish horror movies, Artok's resting place is reimagined as a cairn. And when said cairn is disrupted, the undead tyrant is freed from his captivity to devastating effect. Devil in the Details Other Evidence for Dracula's Irish Origins On its own, the Our Talk story is a compelling piece of evidence for Dracula being rooted primarily in Irish legend and folklore and not Romanian or Wallachian or Transylvanian history. In Our Talk, we have an actual vampire, an unabashedly undead blood drinker who can only be dispatched in a specific ceremonial way. And when you consider Bram Stoker's original intentions for Dracula, the case only becomes stronger. For example, we know from Stoker's notes that the central character of his 1897 novel was originally going to be called Count Vampire. The idea to insert the name Dracula came later, after the crux of the story had been developed. In fact, Dracula wasn't even Stoker's original title for the novel. We know from his 541-page manuscript, discovered in a barn in the 1980s and now owned by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, that Stoker's original title for what would become Dracula was, wait for it, the undead, which, as you'll recall, is the same term used in Irish, Neve Merb, to refer to our talk. And if that wasn't enough, there is yet another clue to be found in Stoker's naming conventions. Enter the character Lucy Westenra, the novel's damsel in distress. When Dracula's not busy lustily draining her blood, the other male characters, foremost among them Professor Abraham Van Helsing, huddle around Ms. Westenra's bed in an effort to save her. Interestingly, an approximation of this very scene can be found in a memorial sculpture inside an Irish church. St. Patrick's Church of Ireland and Monaghan. The sculpture, known as the Parting Glance, portrays a woman on her deathbed while her grieving husband is restrained by a friend. And here's where things get really cuckoo banana birds, to use a technical term. The sculpture was dedicated to a one Mary Ann Westenra by her husband, Lord Warner William Westenra. Mind blown. Of course, unless we can prove that Stoker actually visited St. Patrick's Church of Ireland in Monaghan, we'd be forced to accept this as an extraordinary coincidence. Fortunately, there's a case to be made that Stoker did indeed visit the church. Long before he published Dracula or any of his other novels and stories, Stoker was an inspector of petty sessions. This civil service job saw him visiting hundreds of magistrates or petty sessions courts scattered across Ireland. Thus, it is very likely that his work would have brought Stoker to Monaghan at some point. And wouldn't you know it, the courthouse in Monaghan is located next door to St. Patrick's Church. As local historian Sinead O'Reilly told the BBC, it's possibly as simple as he was on his lunch break and happened to walk into the church. End quote. Real World Stakes Dracula as Social Commentary Say we ignore our talk and Bram Stoker's notes and original manuscript and the ireland westenra connection, our friend Bob Carden would still make the case that Dracula is an inherently Irish novel. And that's because the social conditions of late 19th century Ireland mirror those found in Stoker's portrayal of Transylvania. Remember, Stoker never traveled to Transylvania himself. 
he was not particularly knowledgeable on the local goings-on there. And yet, he makes it a point to describe the local peasantry and how they resent the power wielded by Count Dracula, a wealthy landlord. What's more, despite Stoker himself being an Irish Protestant, he puts Catholic devotional objects in the hands of the peasants, who in turn offer them to Jonathan Harker, a self-described English churchman. One of these devotional objects, the Rosary, ends up protecting Harker from Dracula's advances. Now, what was happening in Ireland while Stoker was writing Dracula? The Home Rule movement was in full swing. At the time, English landlords, many of them absentee, controlled the majority of Ireland's farmland and had undue political influence over local conditions. In response, Irish nationalists, the bulk of them Catholic, campaigned for self-government. Stoker, despite being raised Protestant, supported Home Rule. And according to Dickinson College professor Sarah E. Kirsch, one can interpret Stoker favorable treatment of Catholic symbols in his novel Dracula as the extension of an olive branch. When you take all of these points together, a case can be made that Dracula isn't about a Transylvanian bloodsucker at all. It's about a kingdom sucking power and resources from its subjects. I'll close with this line from Bob Curran, quote, All the elements of Ireland are there, and you're not looking at a horror novel, but at a novel of contemporary issues and about contemporary Ireland. If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment and tap all of the little buttons and by the end of it, make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more about the Irish origins behind some of your favorite beastly beings like banshees, werewolves, and dragons, well, you can check out the videos I made about those and or you can grab a copy of my book, Irish Monsters in Your Pocket. My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of IrishMyths.com. Thanks for coming out.